The History of the Walden Seas Narrated by Timothy Turner Chapter 17 Final Reestablishment in the Valleys The Vaudois had entered the land, but they had not yet got possession of it. They were a mere handful. They would have to face the large and well-appointed army of Piedmont, aided by the French. But their great leader to his courage added faith. The cloud which had guided them over the great mountains, with their snows and abysses, would cover their camp, and lead them forth to battle, and bring them in with victory. It was not surely that they might die in the land, that they had been able to make so marvelous a march back to it. Full of these courageous hopes, the seven hundred now addressed themselves to their great task. They began to climb called Julian, which separates Prowley from the fertile and central valley of the Walden Seas, that of Lucerna, and they toiled up and were now near the summit of the pass. The Piedmontese soldiers who had been stationed there shouted out, Come on, ye barbets, we guard the pass and there are three thousand of us. They did come on. To force the entrenchments and put to flight the garrison was the work of a moment. In the evacuated camp the Vaudois found a store of ammunition and provisions, which to them was a most seasonable booty. Descending rapidly the slopes and precipices of the great mountain, they surprised and took the town of Bobbio, which nestles at its foot. Driving out the popish inhabitants to whom it had been made over, they took possession of their ancient dwellings, and paused a little while to rest after the march, and conflict of the previous days. Here their second Sunday was passed, and public worship again celebrated, the congregation chanting their psalm to the clash of arms. On the day following, repairing to the rock of Sibad, where their fathers had pledged their faith to God and to one another, they renewed on the same sacred spot their ancient oath, swearing with uplifted hands to abide steadfastly in the profession of the gospel, to stand by one another, and never to lay down their arms till they had re-established themselves and their brethren in those valleys which they believed had as really been given to them by the God of heaven, as Palestine had been to the Jews. Their next march was to Valaro, which is situated halfway between Babio at the head and La Torre at the entrance of the valley. This town they stormed and took, driving away the new inhabitants. But here their career of conquest was suddenly checked. The next day a strong reinforcement of regular troops coming up, the Vaudois, were under the necessity of abandoning Valaro and falling back on Babio. The Patriot army now became parted into two bands and for many weeks had to wage a sort of guerrilla war on the mountains. France on the one side and Piedmont on the other poured in soldiers in the hope of exterminating this handful of warriors. The privations and hardships which they endured were as great as the victories which they won in their daily skirmishes were marvelous. But though always conquering, their ranks were rapidly thinning. What though a hundred of the enemy were slain for one Waldensian who fell? The Piedmontese could recruit their numbers. The Vaudois could not add to theirs. They had now neither ammunition nor provisions, save what they took from their enemies. And to add to their perplexities, winter was near which would bury the mountains beneath its snows and leave them without food or shelter. A council of war was held, and it was ultimately resolved to repair to the valley of Martino and entrench themselves on La Basiglia. This brings us to the last heroic stand of the returned exiles. But first let us sketch the natural strength and grandeur of the spot on which that stand was made. The Balsiglia is situated at the western extremity of San Martino, which in point of grandeur yields to few things in the Waldensian Alps. It is some five miles long, by about two in width, having as its floor the richest meadowland, and for walls mountains superbly hung with terraces, overflowing with flower and fruitage, and protected above with splintered cliffs and dark peaks. It is closed at the western extremity, by the naked face of a perpendicular mountain, down which the Germagnosca is seen to dash in a flood of silver. 
the meadows and woods that clothe the bosom of the valley, are seamed by a broad line of white, formed by the torrent, the bed of which is strewn with so many rocks that it resembles a continuous river of foam. Then the clothing of the mountains that form the bounding walls of the valley, nothing could be finer. On the right, as one advances upward, rises a succession of terraced vineyards, finely diversified with cornfields and knolls of rock, which are crowned with cottages or hamlets, looking out from amid their rich embowerings of chestnut and apple tree. Above this fruit-bearing zone are the grassy uplands, the resort of herdsmen, which in their turn give place to the rocky ridges that in wavy and serrated lines run off to the higher summits, which recede into the clouds. On the left, the mountain wall is more steep, but equally rich in its clothing. Swathing its foot is a carpeting of delicious sward. Trees, vast of girth, part with their overarching branches, the bright sunlight. Higher up are fields of maize and forests of chestnut, and higher still is seen the rock-loving birch, with its silvery stem and graceful tresses. Along the splintered rocks above runs a bristling line of firs, forming mighty chevaux de frise. Toward the head of the valley, near the vast perpendicular cliff already mentioned, which shuts it in on the west, is seen a glorious assemblage of mountains. One mighty cone uplifts itself above and behind another, to the last and highest buries its top in the rolling masses of cloud, which are seen usually hanging like a canopy above this part of the valley. These noble agiles, four in number, rise feathery with firs, and remind one of the fretted pinnacles of some colossal cathedral. This is La Balsiglia. It was on the terraces of this mountain that Henry Arnaud, with his patriot warriors, pitched his camp amid the dark tempests of winter, and the yet darker tempests of a furious and armed bigotry. The Balsiglia shoots its gigantic pyramids heavenward, as if proudly conscious of having once been the resting place of the Vaudois Ark. It is no castle of man's erecting. It had for its builder the almighty architect himself. It only remains, in order to complete this picture of a spot so famous in the wars of conscience and liberty, to say that behind the Balsiglia, on the west, rises the lofty Col du Pis. It is rarely that this mountain permits the spectator a view of his full stature, for his dark sides run up and bury themselves in the clouds. Face to face with the Col du Pis, stands on the other side of the valley, the yet loftier Mont Guinevert, with most commonly a veil of cloud around him, as if he too were unwilling to permit to the eye of visitor a sight of his stately proportions. Thus did these two Alps, like twin giants, guard this famous valley. It was on the lower terrace of this pyramidal mountain, the Balsiglia, that Henry Arnaud, his army now alas reduced to four hundred, sat down. Viewed from the level of the valley, the peak seems to terminate in a point, but on ascending the top expands into a level grassy plateau. Steep and smooth as a scarped fortress, it is unscalable on every side save that on which a stream rushes past from the mountains. The skill of Arnaud enabled him to add to the natural strength of the Vaudois position the defenses of art. They enclosed themselves within earthen walls and ditches. They erected covered ways. They dug out some fourscore cellars in the rock to hold provisions, and they built huts as temporary barracks. Three springs that gushed out of the rock supplied them with water. They constructed similar entrenchments on each of the three peaks that rose above them, so that if the first were taken, they could ascend to the second and so on to the fourth. On the loftiest summit of the Balsiglia, which commanded the entire valley, they placed a centennial to watch the movements of the enemy. Only three days elapsed till four battalions of the French army arrived and enclosed the Balsiglia on every side. On the 29th of October, an assault was made on the Vaudois position, 
which was repulsed with great slaughter of the enemy, and the loss of not one man to the defenders. The snows of early winter had begun to fall, and the French general thought it best to postpone the task of capturing the Balsiglia till spring. Destroying all the corn which the Vaudois had collected and stored in the villages, he began his retreat from San Martino, and taking laconic farewell of the Waldenses, he bade them have patience till Easter, when he would again pay them a visit. All through the winter of 1689-90, to the Vaudois remained in their mountain fortress, resting after their marches, battles, and sieges of the previous months, and preparing for the promised return of the French. Where Henry Arnaud had pitched his camp, there had he also raised his altar, and if from that mountain top was pealed forth the shout of battle, from it ascended also morning and night the prayer and the psalm. Besides daily devotions, Henry Arnaud preached two sermons weekly, one on Sunday and another on Thursday. At stated times he administered the Lord's Supper. Nor was the commissariat overlooked. Foraging parties brought in chestnuts, apples, and other fruits, which the autumn now far advanced had fully ripened. A strong detachment made an incursion into the French valleys of Frogolis and Caris, and returned with salt, butter, some hundred head of sheep, and a few oxen. The enemy before departing had destroyed their stock of grain, and as the fields were long since reaped, they despaired of being able to repair their loss, and yet bread to last them all the winter through had been provided, in a way so marvelous as to convince them that he who feeds the fowls of the air was caring for them. Ample magazines of grain lay all around their encampment, although unknown as yet to them. The snow that year began to fall earlier than usual, and it covered up the ripened corn, which the popish inhabitants had not time to cut when the approach of the Vaudois compelled them to flee. From this unexpected storehouse the garrison drew as they had need. Little did the popish peasantry, when they sowed the seed in spring, dream that the Vaudois hands would reap the harvest. Corn had been provided for them, and to Vaudois eyes, provided almost as miraculously as was the manna for the Israelites. But where were they to find the means of grinding it into meal? At almost the foot of the Balsiglia, on the stream of Germagnosca, is a little mill. The owner, M. Trompolot, three years before, when going forth into exile with his brethren, threw the millstone into the river. For, said he, it may yet be needed. It was needed now. In search being made for it, it was discovered, drawn out of the stream, and the mill set a-working. There was another, and more distant mill at the entrance to the valley, to which the garrison had recourse when the immediate precincts of the Balsiglia were occupied by the enemy, and the nearer mill was not available. Both mills exist to this day. The roofs of brown slate may be seen by the visitor, peering up through the luxuriant foliage of the valley. The wheel, motionless it may be, and the torrent which turned it, shooting idly past in a volley of spray. With the return of spring the army of France and Piedmont reappeared. The Valsiglia was now completely invested. The combined force, amounting to 22,000 in all, 10,000 French, and 12,000 Piedmontese. The troops were commanded by the celebrated de Catinat, lieutenant general of the armies of France. The 400 Waldenses looked down from their camp of rock on the valley beneath them, and saw it glittering with steel by day, and shining with campfires by night. Catinat never doubted that a single day's fighting would enable him to capture the place, and that the victory which he looked upon as already won might be duly celebrated. He ordered four hundred ropes to be sent along with the army, in order to hang at once the four hundred Waldenses, and he had commanded the inhabitants of Pinerolo to prepare feu de joie to grace his return from the campaign. The headquarters of the French were at Great Passet, so called in contradistinction to Little Passet, situated a mile lower in the valley. Great Passet counts some thirty roofs and is placed on an immense ledge of rock that juts out from the foot of Mont Genevert, 
some 800 feet above the stream and right opposite the Balsiglia. On the flanks of this rocky ledge are still to be seen the ruts worn by the cannon and baggage wagons of the French army. There can be no doubt that these marks are the memorials of the siege, for no other wheeled vehicles ever were seen in these mountains. Having reconnoitred, Cadinot ordered the assault May 1, 1690. Only on that side of Balsiglia, where a stream trickles down from the mountains, and which offers a gradual slope, instead of a wall of rock as everywhere else, could the attack be made with any chance of success. But this point Henry Arnaud had taken care to fortify with strong palisades. Five hundred picked men, supported by seven thousand musketeers, advanced to storm the fortress. They rushed forward with ardor. They threw themselves upon the palisades, but they found it impossible to tear them down, formed as they were of great trunks, fastened by mighty boulders. Massed behind the defense were the Vaudois, the younger men loading the muskets, and the veterans taking steady aim, while the besiegers were falling in dozens at every volley. The assailants beginning to waver, the Waldensians made a fierce sally, sword in hand, and cut in pieces those whom the musket had spared. Of the five hundred picked soldiers, only some score lived to rejoin the main body, which had been spectators from the valley of their total rout. Incredible as it may appear, we are nevertheless assured of it as a fact that not a Vaudois was killed or wounded, not a bullet had touched one of them. The fireworks which Cadinat had been so provident as to bid the men of Pinerlo get ready to celebrate his victory were not needed that night. Despairing of reducing the fortress by other means, the French now brought up cannon, and it was not till the 14th of May that all was ready and that the last and grand assault was made across the ravine, in which the conflict we have just described, took place, an immense knoll juts out, at an equal level with the lower entrenchments of the Walden Seas. To this rock the cannons were hoisted up to play upon the fortress. Never before had the sound of artillery shaken the rocks of San Martino. It was the morning of Whit Sunday, and the Walden Seas were preparing to celebrate the Lord's Supper, when the first boom from the enemy's battery broke upon their ear. All the day the cannonading continued, and its dreadful noises re-echoed from rock to rock, and rolled upward to the summits of the Col du Pice, and the Mont Guinevert, were still further heightened by the thousands of musketeers who were stationed all around Balsiglia. When night closed in, the ramparts of the Waldenses were in ruins, and it was seen that it would not be possible longer to maintain the defense. What was to be done? The cannonading had ceased for the moment, but assuredly the dawn would see the attack renewed. Never before had destruction appeared to impend, so inevitably over the Vaudois. To remain where they were was certain death, yet whither could they flee? Behind them rose the unscalable precipices of the Col du Pice, and beneath them lay the valley, swarming with foes. If they should wait till the morning broke, it would be impossible to pass the enemy without being seen. And even now, although it was night, the numerous campfires that blazed beneath them made it almost as bright as day. But the hour of their extremity was the time of God's opportunity. Often before it had been seen to be so, but perhaps never so strikingly as now. While they looked this way and that, but could discover no escape from the net that enclosed them, the mist began to gather on the summits of the mountains around them. They knew the old mantle that was one to be cast around their fathers in the hour of peril. It crept lower and yet lower on the great mountains. Now it touched the supreme peak of Balsiglia. Will it mock their hopes? Will it only touch but not cover their mountain camp? Again, it is in motion. Downward roll its white fleecy billows, and now it hangs in sheltering folds around the war-battered fortress and its handful of heroic defenders. They dared not as yet attempt escape, for still the watchfires burned brightly in the valley, but it was only for a few minutes longer. The mist kept its downward course, and now all was dark. 
a Tartarian gloom fell the gorge of San Martino. At this moment, as the garrison stood mute, pondering whereunto these things would grow, Captain Poulat, a native of these parts, broke silence. He bade them be of good courage, for he knew the paths, and would conduct them past the French and Piedmontese lines by a track known only to himself. Crawling on their hands and knees, and passing close to the French centennials, yet hidden from them by the mist, they descended frightful precipices and made their escape. He who has not seen such paths, says Arnaud, in his Reine Tre Glories, cannot conceive the danger of them, and will be inclined to consider my account of the march a mere fiction. But it is strictly true, and I must add, the place is so frightful that even some of the Vaudois themselves were terror-stricken when they saw by daylight the nature of the spot they had passed in the dark. When the day broke, every eye in the plain below was turned to the Balsiglia. That day the four hundred ropes, which Cadenat had brought with him, were to be put in requisition, and the Fou de Joy, so long prepared, were to be lighted at Pinerolo. What was their amazement to find the Balsiglia abandoned? The Vaudois had escaped and were gone, and might be seen upon the distant mountains, climbing the snows, far out of the reach of their would-be captors. Well might they sing, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. There followed several days during which they wandered from hill to hill, or lay hid in woods, suffering great privations, and encountering numerous perils. At last they succeeded in reaching the Prado del Tor. To their amazement and joy, on arriving at this celebrated and hallowed spot, they found deputies from their prince, the Duke of Savoy, waiting them with an overture of peace. The Vaudois were as men that dreamed. An overture of peace? How was this? A coalition including Germany, Great Britain, Holland, and Spain had been formed to check the ambition of France and three days had been given to Victor Amadeus to say to which side he would join himself, the Leaguers or Louis the Fourteenth. He resolved to break with Louis and to take part with the coalition. In this case, to whom could he so well commit the keys of the Alps as to his trusty Vaudois, hence the overture that met them in the Pradel Tor? Ever ready to rally round the throne of their prince, the moment the hand of persecution was withdrawn, the Vaudois closed with the peace offered them. Their towns and lands were restored. Their churches were reopened for Protestant worship. Their brethren still in prison at Turin were liberated, and the colonists of their countrymen in Germany had passports to return to their homes. And thus, after a dreary interval of three and a half years, the valleys were again peopled with their ancient race and resounded with their ancient songs. So closed that famous period of their history, which in respect of the wonders, we might say the miracles that attended it, we can compare only to the march of the chosen people through the wilderness to the land of promise. <laughs>